had promised them an era of democracy and self determination after the war and during the war both sides to the war they had launched some vicious propaganda to malign each other and expose each others uncivilized colonial record but soon it was clear from paris peace conference and other peace treaties that the imperialistic power it had no intention of leasing their holds over the colonies and in fact we can say that they went on to divide the colonies and all this it served as a myth of cultural and military superiority of the whites and as a result of this post war period it saw a resurgence of militant nationalist activity throughout asia and africa impact of russian revolution the bolshevik party of workers they overthrew czarist regime and they founded the first socialist state the soviet union under the leadership of waldemir who is also called as lenin the soviet union it unilaterally it renounced the czarist imperialist rights in china and rest of asia also and they gave rights to self determination to former czarist colonies in asia and they gave equal status to asian nationalist within its borders and after that the october revolution it brought home the message that immense power it lay with the people and the masses were capable of challenging even the mightiest of tyrants provided if they were organized united and determined so and in case of failure of constitutional machineries in the province the governor could take over the administration of transferred subjects also and the secretary of state for india and the governor general they could interfere in respect of reserved subjects while in the respect of transferred subjects the scope of their interference was restricted legislature the provincial legislative council it was further expanded and about 70% of the members were to be elected and the system of communal and class electorates it was further consolidated women were also given the right to vote and the legislative councils could initiate legislation but the governor's assent was required for everything and the governor he had the power like veto bills and to issue ordinances the legislative council could reject the budget but the governor could restore it if it is necessary and the legislatures they enjoyed the freedom of speech mountek chemsford reforms and government of india act 1919 the british government they were not prepared to part with or even they are not ready to share its power with the indians and once again they restored to the policy of carrot and stick the carrot it was represented by insubstantial montek chemsford reforms while the measures such as rawl act it represented to the stick so in the lines with the government policy it contained in montek statement of august 1917 that the government announced further constitutional reforms in july 1918 which is known as montek chemsford reforms and based on this the government of india act 1919 was enacted M- the main features of montek reforms so let's study about some main features of montek chemsford reforms first comes provincial government in this provincial government montek he introduced diarchy the act it was introduced diarchy for the executive at all levels of provincial government diarchy means government by two independent authorities executive diarchy that is the rule of two executive councillors and popular ministers it was in introduced through diarchy by montek chemsford by his reforms 
and the governor he was to be the executive head in the province the subjects were divided into two list reserved subjects and transferred subjects reserved subjects it included subjects like the law and order finance land revenue irrigation and so on and the transferred subjects it included uh, subjects like education health local government industry agriculture exercise and so on the reserved subjects it were to be administered by the governor through his executive council of bureaucrats and the transferred subjects they were to be administered by the ministers nominated from among the elected members of legislative council the ministers they were responsible to the legislature and they had to resign if no confidence motion was passed against them by the legislature and while the executive councillors they were not to be responsible to legislature central government central government it was still without a responsible government no responsible government it was envisaged in the act for the government at the all india level and the main points were at the executive level the governor he was to be the chief executive authority and there were to be two list for administration one is centralist and the other is provincialist and in the viceroy's executive council of 8 three were to be indians among eight members only three members were indians and majority were britishers the governor general retained full control over the reserved subjects in the provinces and the governor general could restore cuts in the grants certify bills he could certify also rejected bills by the central legislature and he can issue ordinances legislature so a bicameral arrangement was introduced the lower house or central legislative assembly it consisted of about 145 members and among them 41 were nominated and one or four members were elected and out of this one or four members 52 were general people and 30 members were muslims and 26 people and 20 special people and the upper house or council of the state it had 60 members and of them 26 members were nominated and 34 members were elected and out of 34 members 20 were general people 10 were muslims and 3 were europeans and 1 were sikhs the council of the state it had a tenure of 5 years and it had only male members while the central legislative assembly it had a ten- tenure of 3 years the legislatures they could ask questions and supplementaries they can pass adjournment motions and uh, vote a part of the budget but 75% of the budget it was still non votable some indians they found their way to important committees including finance on the home government that is in britain on this home government front the government of india act 1919 it made an important challenge that is the secretary of state for india should be paid out of british exchequer they should not be taken out from indian money drawbacks of the reforms the reforms had many drawbacks franchise was very limited and the electorate was extended to some extent and 1 and 1/2 million of the central legislature and while the population of, of india it was around 260 million as per one estimate and at the center the legislature had no control over the viceroy and also his executive council division of the subjects it was not satisfactory at the center allocation of the seats for central legislature to the provinces it was based on importance of provinces for example 
Punjab's military importance and Bombay's commercial importance. And at the level of provinces, division of subjects and parallel administration of the two parts, it was irrational. And also it was unworkable. And subjects like irrigation, finance, police, press and justice, they were reserved. The provincial ministers, they had no control over finances and also over the bureaucrats. So if they had no control, this would lead to constant friction between the two. Ministers were often not consulted on important matters. And in fact, they could be overruled by the governor on any matter. And it, on any matter that were considered by the ministers, it can be later considered by the governor. So in this way, the minister's rule it was overruled by the governor. Congress reaction. Congress, they met in a special session in August 1918 at Bombay under Hassan Imam's presidency and they declared the reforms to be disappointing and unsatisfactory and they demanded for effective self-government. The Montague reforms, it was termed as unworthy and it was disappointing and they mentioned it as a sunless dawn and it was mentioned by Tilak and even as Annie Besant found them unworthy of England to offer and India to accept. Early career of Gandhi, Mohandas Karanchand Gandhi, he was born on October 2nd, 1869, he was born in Porbandar in a princely state of Kathiawar in Gujarat. His father was Divan. Divan means Minister of the State. Gandhi studied law in England in the year 1898 and he went to South Africa in connection with a case that was involving his client Dada Abdullah. And in South Africa, he witnessed a very ugly face of white racism and humiliation and the contempt to which Asians who had gone to South Africa as laborers were subjected. So, at that time, Mahatma Gandhi, he decided to stay in South Africa to organize the Indian workers to enable them to fight for their rights. So, he stayed there till 1914 after which he returned to India. The Indians in South Africa, they consisted of three categories. One, the indentured Indian labor, mainly from South Africa, who had migrated to South Africa after 19. So, this were the people who migrated to South Africa after 1890 to work on sugar plantations. And secondly, the merchants. These merchants, they were mostly a Mamam Muslims who followed the laborers. And third, the ex-indentured laborers who settled down with their children in South Africa and after the expiry of their contracts also. These Indians, they were mostly illiterate and they had little or no knowledge of English at all. They accepted those racial discrimination as part of their daily existence. And this Indian immigrants, they had to suffer many disabilities. They were denied the right to vote. They should reside only in prescribed locations. And in some colonies, Asians and Africans, they could not stay outdoors after 9 p.m. Nor they could not use public food paths also. And then started a moderate phase of the struggle by Gandhi. And though that struggle, it was from 1894 to 1906. Moderate phase of struggle. So this took place around 1894 to 1906. So during this moderate phase, Gandhi relied on sending petitions and memorials to authorities in South Africa and also in Britain, hoping that once the authorities were informed of the plights of Indians, 
they would take a severe action towards it to redress their grievances and to unite different sections of indians he set up a natal indian congress natal indian congress and it started a paper called indian opinion phase of passive resistance or satyagraha satyagraha it is also known as the phase of passive resistance so this was the second phase which began around 1906 and it was characterized by the use of the method of passive resistance or civil disobedience so this civil disobedience it was called by gandhi as satyagraha satyagraha against registration certificates and this took place around 1906 this was a new legislation in south africa and it made compulsory for all the indians to carry their registrations with their fingerprints at all the time and this certificate should be with the indians at all the time wherever they travel in south africa the indians under gandhi's leadership they decided not to submit this discriminatory measure and gandhi he formed a passive resistance association to conduct the campaign of defying the law and suffering all the penalties so and therefore from there on satyagraha was born satyagraha means a devotion to truth the technique of resisting adversaries without any violence the government it jailed gandhi and also others who refused to register themselves and later the authorities they used a deceit to make this defiant indians register themselves and the indians under the leadership of gandhi they retaliated by publicly burning the registration certificates and all this showed up the south african government in a bad light and in the end there was a compromise settlement gandhi's campaign against restriction on indian migration the earlier campaign it was widened to include protest against a new legislation imposing re- restrictions on indian migration and the indians they defied this law by crossing over from one province to another province and they by also refusing to produce their license and to this act many of the indians were jailed campaign against poll tax and invalidation of indian marriages a poll tax of 3 pounds it was imposed on all ex indentured indians and the demand for the abolition of poll tax it widened the base of the campaign and then a supreme court order which invalidated all the marriages which was not conducted according to christian rights and the marriages it should be compulsorily registered by the registrar of marriages if not those marriages were invalid so by implication hindu muslim and parsi marriages act were illegal and the children born out of such marriages they were illegitimate the indians treated this judgment as an insult to the honor of women and many women they were drawn into the movement because of this indignity protest against transvaal immigration act so the indians protested the transvaal immigration act by illegally migrating from natal into transvaal the government held this indians to jail miners and plantation workers they went on a lightning strike and in india gokale gopala krishna gokale he toured the whole country mobilizing public opinion in support of indians in south africa and even the viceroy lord hardinge he condemned the repression and he called for an impartial inquiry compromise solution so even though a series of negotiations it involved gandhi lord hardinge c f andreeves and general smuts an agreement was reached by which 
the government of south africa it considered the major indian demands relating to the poll tax and the registration certificates and marriages it solemnized according to indian rights and it promised to treat the issue of indian immigration in a sympathetic manner gandhi's experience in south africa so gandhi found that the masses they had very immense capacity to participate in and sacrifice for cause that moved them he was able to unite indians belonging to different religions and classes and men and women alike under his leadership gandhi also came to realize that at the times the leaders had to take decisions and he was able to evolve his own style of leadership and politics and new techniques of struggle on a limited scale gandhi's technique of satyagraha so gandhi he evolved the technique of satyagraha during his stay in south africa it was based on truth and non violence he combined some elements from indian tradition with a christian requirement of turning the other cheek and the philosophy of tolstoy tolstoy said the evil could best be countered by non violent resistance so its basic tenets were a satyagrahi was not to submit to what he considered as wrong but was to always remain truthful non violent and fearless a satyagrahi he works on the principle of withdrawal of cooperation and boycott and methods of satyagraha included non payment of taxes and declining honors and position of the authority a satyagrahi he should be ready to accept suffering in a struggle against the wrong doer and this suffering it was to be a part of his love for truth a true satyagrahi he would never bow before the evil whatever may be the consequence and only the brave and the strong they could practice satyagraha and it was not for the weak and cowardly he said gandhi said satyagraha it was not for the weak and covered people and even violence was preferred to cowardice and he thought that never to be separated from this practices in other words ends could not justify the means so let's continue our discussion on gandhi in the next session the next session let's discuss about the champran satyagraha which was the first civil disobedience and ahmedabad mill strike and that was the first hunger strike and next keda satyagraha that was the first non cooperation and many more acts so see you all in the next session and let's continue our discussion on gandhi thank you